Guys, by now you should know that uh, we're four weeks in. This is week five. We're going to speak about missions and the Holy Spirit tonight, which is obviously very, very important, and you'll see why. Um, but you should know by now that this is going to cost you something. And I'm not talking about money, even though it's going to cost you a lot of money as well. Um, but this is going to cost you, it's going to cost you your time, it's going to cost you time away. It's going to cost you to lay down some of your own dreams, to lay down some of your own desires. It's going to cost you to spend time away from family and people that you love. It's going to cost you to learn new things that you've never thought ever you'd start learning. It's going to cost you to do more homework and spend more time on things that you never thought that you're going to spend time on. It's going to cost you more time in prayer. It's going to cost you more time in fasting. It's going to cost you more time in the Word of God. This, this is going to cost you. Missions is not something that is for free. If it was easy, everyone would have done it. Everyone would have done it if it was easy. If it didn't cost anything, the world would have been evangelized by now. Okay? So this thing is going to cost you. Remember what Jesus said, that no master builder comes and builds without reckoning the cost first. So you need to know that this thing is going to cost you something. And you're going to have to decide from the beginning. It doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter what it, what it costs. Sounds, sounds noble to say that and sounds noble to pray that. I mean, isn't Christians supposed to pray that? But I know when, when Taki hits the tar, rubber hits the road, get stuff. It's, it's hard, okay? But know why you're doing this. You're doing this for the treasure in the field. And the treasure in the field is not the nation that you've been praying for. The treasure in the field is Jesus. The treasure in the field. He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He's the rewarder of those who live a life that is laid down for the King of Kings. He is also the one that said that if we want to follow Him, we need to take up our cross daily. He is also the one that said that if we love mother or father or husband or wife or children more than Him, then we're not worthy to be called His disciples. So never use your family as an excuse for missions. Never use your children or your wife or your spouse as an excuse for missions, okay? If God is calling you towards this thing, then your first and foremost response is, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Is it, is it hard? Definitely. Is it always fun? Definitely not, okay? I remember... We were praying at Milstrom. I think a lot of you guys know Milstrom. Um, it's uh, just outside of Woodbank, between Woodbank and Brongospreit on one of the old farm roads um, around. And Milstrom is a place where there was revival in the early 1900s, where the farm people would actually gather in a church. I've got a photo of the church. I've actually showed it in, the, in, in our church as well. I've showed the photo. Um, they were praying there, and all of a sudden, while they were praying, the um, fire department showed up with their sirens and everything showed up because the church was on fire, and they wanted to come and put out the fire. And when the people came out, they said, no, no, it's, it's not on fire. We're just praying. Everything is okay. And uh, it was actually really burning, but it was not being consumed. And revival broke out. The firemen, as they jumped off the fire truck and got the hose to go and put out the fire, they started speaking in tongues because the Holy Spirit came over them. Um, so that's this small church called in, in Milstrom. Um, so we were praying there. I can't remember the year. It was before COVID that we were praying there. And the, the one moment... Um, 
we started off with many people, or was it after COVID? I can't remember. It was before COVID. I think it was 2020, just before COVID hit. We were there, we were praying, um, we were a lot of people, and then there were just two of us. It was me and another, another pastor. We, were, we started off with like 20. And as I was there and, and praying, I said, Lord, let the revival fires that hit this house hit us, hit my heart, hit my mind, hit my life. Let what you did here, let it happen again. Almost like that Billy Graham prayer. You've heard the story of Billy Graham going to John Wesley's house, laying down in where John Wesley used to pray um, and saying, Lord, do it again, Lord, do it again. And the Lord used Billy Graham mightily. Obviously, you've heard that, that story. That's what I was praying for. And the next moment I heard a voice, and the voice sounded exactly like the Lord's. Exactly sounded like the Lord's. And when it started speaking, I thought it was the Lord speaking to me. And this is what the voice said. I will take everything from you. I will take your family. I will take your wife. I will take your future children. I will take your finances. I will take your ministry. I will take everything from you. And the fear gripped my heart. And that moment that the fear gripped my heart, I breathed in and I was like, Lord, this cannot be. And I heard the Holy Spirit saying to me, it is not I. This is not me speaking. And the Holy Spirit revealed to me that the principality that stopped the revival just came and started, tried to intimidate me on what I've been praying for. And from there, I knew that whatever we pursue that is in the heart of God, it's going to cost us something. Don't let anyone tell you that it's for free. Jesus paid it all, so we don't have to pay anything. It's religious nonsense, okay? He paid everything so that we don't have to wrestle anymore concerning certain stuff. But it's the laid-down lovers that Jesus uses, that the Holy Spirit uses. And that's exactly the same with missions as well. It's the laid down lovers that the Lord is going to use in the nations. I love what Mike Bickle says. Mike Bickle says, lovers will always outwork workers. So it's the laid down lovers. It's not the religious workers and the religious mindsets and those who or at church and want to tick their religious boxes um, and market on Instagram that they've been on a mission trip and now they feel better about themselves, that's going to make a difference in the nations, is the laid down lovers that see the heart of Jesus burning for a certain region and just saying, Lord, doesn't matter what it costs, doesn't matter how long, doesn't matter what you're asking of me, I'm going, I'm going for this because I see how important this is for you. Okay. So, uh, one thing I just shared with, with Ilza, um, this is not something that I heard the Lord saying, but this is something that is in my heart, uh, is that we said that we uh, need to start praying about a, a, a mission trip for the TSC students, everyone that's here. Where are we going? What's, what's going to happen? So, one thing that's in my heart that I'm thinking of is looking at the time frame of November, the month of November. We might be doing a trip to Tunisia or Algeria. Tunisia and Algeria is right next to each other, if you don't know. Okay. Um, Algeria is the biggest nation in Africa, if you didn't know. And Tunisia is the, the furthest part of Africa, north, the highest part of Africa. Um, both Muslim nations, both 99% Muslim. We don't have any open door yet there. We don't have any contact there. There's no churches there that we know of. Uh, so we might organize a date where we go there on a prayer mission trip. Okay. Going into that region, praying, asking Holy Spirit what He wants us to do, how He wants us to respond. So we'll be talking about dates. I'll go and check the um, prices and all that stuff, and then through the course of CSC, I'll be speaking to you about that, and then we'll start praying into this if the Lord wants us to go or if He wants us to stay. Okay. Remember that our default is always, okay, we never ask the Lord, Lord, do you want us to go? Because He already said go. Go and make disciples. That's our default. So we never ask the Lord if He wants us to go. We always ask the Lord, Lord, do you want us to stay? Okay. 
<laughs> so we'll be, we'll be doing that. All right, let's start off with tonight. I want to, there's a lot of scriptures. You know that we're busy with teaching. This is not preaching. So we're going to um, start off by, by speaking about the importance of the Holy Spirit, obviously in missions. But l- let me just start off with, with, with this. Guys, if, if you don't know how important the Holy Spirit is to your normal Christian life, you'll never realize how important the Holy Spirit is to missions. The first place that you need in your life, the first realization, the first revelation that you need to carry is how much you need Holy Spirit. Let me put it in perspective like this. If Jesus, who was fully man and fully God, only relied on the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit to walk on this earth and do everything that the Father put in His heart and everything that that the Father spoke, how much more do we need Holy Spirit to help us? Okay, so we need Holy Spirit. But tonight, specifically speaking about missions, we are going to look at some scriptures. We're going to start off in Acts 11. So you can go to, go to Acts 11 so long. Acts 11 verse 19, and then we'll go to Acts 13, and then we'll go to Acts 16, and uh, then I'll guide you from there. There's a lot of scriptures that we're going to share. Um, If you want a heart for missions, you don't have one yet, even though you're doing this course, just start reading the book of Acts. Okay? The book of Acts is the biggest missions book in the Bible. And that was the mission of the church and just how literally the church took the words of Jesus and what they did with the words of and the passion that that Jesus had in his heart. Okay. Acts 11, verse verse 19, I'm going to read for us. Verse 19 to verse 26. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Okay? Some important information. First of all, because of the persecution that Stephen faced. So Stephen, the very first martyr of the church, um, which was instigated through Saul, actually, the moment that he was martyred, the moment that he died, there was big repercussions in that. People actually fled, people were scared, people withdrew, people went to other nations because of that. And while the enemy thought that he won, and while these people actually thought that they withdrew, they were actually furthering the gospel because the gospel actually spread to the nations that they went to. Now, I don't know if you have a map inside of your Bible just to see where these nations are, but it's actually um, interesting because Cyprus is still called Cyprus. Okay? Antioch is not called Antioch anymore. It's called Antakya. That's where the big earthquake was last year. This time, last year, February, a big earthquake hit the top of Syria and the bottom part of Turkey, um, Antakya, and there were 60,000 people that died because of the earthquake. Um, and that's Antioch, obviously. And then Cyprus is somewhere there. I actually didn't look on the map, so you just go and have a, have a look. Um, so, <laughs> so I actually, in the notes that you will receive in the week, I actually put in a map for you guys so that you can see. Because when you start reading from Acts 11 to Acts 19, you'll see that the Bible speaks about two Antiochs. There wasn't just one Antioch, there was another Antioch. The one Antioch, what what we're reading about now, and then there was another Antioch where they actually did not want to receive the gospel. And they were very against Christianity. So there were two Antiochs, but the one Antioch, this Antioch today is called Antakya. Uh, We might be going there in our April trip now, um, going down into the earthquake zone um, and seeing what the churches are doing there, okay? Um, and that is where this was happening, which the, the Bible is speaking, to, speaking about right now. So at the top of Syria um, and the bottom of Turkey, a town called Antioch, okay? And then another thing that was interesting in this first verse is that they did not share the gospel with Gentiles to Jews only. Okay? Only to the Jews. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, 
preaching the Lord Jesus. So just some context, the Hellenists were the Jews that spoke Greek. Okay? So Jews' language is actually Hebrew. You know that, right? Okay? But the Jews that fled and the Jews that dispersed into the nations actually started to learning the, the language of the nation. And the Jews here were called Hellenists because they spoke Greek, not Hebrew. And then they obviously spoke to them, or they spoke of them, of the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, in my Bible, I have that underlined, preaching the Lord Jesus, okay? When you go on missions or when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is the basic. This is the most important thing. What do you preach? You preach Jesus, Sometimes we feel like we want to start with Adam, Noah, Abraham, go through with David. And listen, sometimes Holy Spirit will, will allow you to start at, at certain, certain places, but our go-to and default is we preach Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged them all with purpose. This is interesting because Barnabas' name is called Son of Encouragement. That's his name, the meaning of his name, Son of Encouragement. And what does he do when he gets there? He encourages them. All with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. And then speaking about Barnabas in verse 24, it says, He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed from Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, the very first place in the history of the church where people were called Christians was in the city of Antioch, Antakya, in Turkey, first place. People looked at, uh, pe looked at the believers, whom they called themselves the way, they looked at them, they saw that their lives looked like the one that they're talking about, and then they said, you look like the one that you're talking about, Christians, okay? Which is an awesome statement. All right, so after Stephen was martyred, Paul had this great conversion on the road of Damascus, and when he was converted, he returned to Jerusalem, and when he returned to Jerusalem, the church was in chaos. Everyone was fleeing. Everyone was going to different regions of the world. And then as, because of the fact that Paul, Saul, came into Jerusalem and became a part of the church, there was a lot of mistrust. So that made that a lot of believers didn't want to come to church anymore because they were scared of Saul and scared of his intentions. And what also what happened was because of the fact that Saul was a part of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was the Pharisees and the Sadducees combined, okay? The Sanhedrin. Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin. They were scared of the repercussions of the Sanhedrin when the Sanhedrin found out where Saul was and whom he was mingling with. And that is why the church actually said to Saul, Saul, please go back to your hometown. Go back to Tarsus. Okay? We need you to be there for a while. Just let the dust settle Everything is too hot. Everything is too dangerous. Um, please go back, okay? Barnabas is sent by the apostles to Antioch after they heard what the Holy Spirit is busy doing in that city. And as Barnabas goes there, he remembers that Antioch is actually very close to Tarsus. And he was there when Saul came, was converted, repented, came to the Lord, came back to the church in Jerusalem, spoke to the apostles there, and when the apostles sent them out, Barnabas was in the room. So he actually is at a place where he remembers the calling and the purpose of Saul and looks at the church, 
what he's leading now, that's in a mini revival, people coming in, and he just thinks by himself, this church needs soul. So he leaves everything. Okay? He's the guy leading the church. He's the guy leading the mini revival at this moment. He leaves everything to go and find this one person that the whole church and the Sanhedrin and the Jews, everyone is afraid of. And he brings him back. Remember, or just think by yourselves, how this church would have reacted the moment that Saul walked into that place. Seriously, Barnabas, you left us for over a month or months to go and find a guy because you told us that this guy is going to help us and minister to us and, and lead us um, and bring so much revelation. And the moment that you bring him in here, it's the guy that actually was the cause of Stephen's death. And Stephen's death is the reason why we're in this town. So a huge shock on the church. But the word of the Lord says that they actually ministered there for a year. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Okay. So bear with me. There's a reason why we started at Acts 11. Acts 13. Acts 11 gives us a little bit more context for what happens in Acts 13. Okay? So in Acts 13, verse 1, we read 2 verse 4. Now in the church that was at Antioch, that's the same Antioch in, uh, speaking about in, in um, 11, okay? there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called to them. And then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, not by the church, sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Okay. So very important, verse 2, these believers, these leaders were actually gathered together and they were busy with the most important ministry in the church. There's no ministry in the church that is more important than the ministry that they were busy with. Okay? Not children's ministry, not the worship team, not the preacher, not whatever ministry you can talk about, not counseling. The most important ministry in the church, these leaders were busy with it. What were they doing? They were ministering to the Lord. I.e., in example, they were doing what David was doing in the tabernacle of David. Audience of one, it's not about people. They don't have a program in their church where they get the whole church together and now they're ministering to the people in the church. No, they're gathered at church together but they are gathered around one person and one person alone, and that is Jesus Christ, and they are ministering to Him, praying to Him, singing to Him, spending time with Him. And the Word of the Lord says they fasted. And guys, let me say this, that prayer and fasting is going to be a practice that is a part of every missionary heart. If you have a missionary heart, if you have a heart to go, if you have a heart for the nations, Prayer and fasting will be a part of who you are. And if it's not, make it a part of who you are. Start fasting. Start praying. 
Make this a principle in your life. Make this, make this a discipline in, in your life. And then listen to what, the Holy, to what the Word of God is saying here. It says that the Holy Spirit chose. Now the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. But wait a minute. Barnabas and Saul are the leaders of the church. He can't take them. Take the other ones. They need to lead the church. They need to walk in front. They need to preach. They need to raise up leaders. They need to be the overseers. They need to be the ones that pray, that spend time in the Word. They're the ones that should stay. No, no, no. Send Simon. Take Manaean. But no, the Holy Spirit has other plans. He's like, set apart for me, Barnabas. Set apart for me, Saul. Why? For the work to which I have called them. But Lord, they are called to lead the church. They are called to walk in front and tell us where to go and preach to us on Sundays and bring us a greater revelation of who Jesus is through breaking open the scriptures of God. No, the Holy Spirit has other plans. So oftentimes when you get into the missionary circles, you'll hear a lot of the preachers or speakers talk about, talk about um, setting apart the best ones, okay? And that offends the re religious mindset. Let me just tell you that, okay? I remember that the first time we spoke of this in our team, our full-time team, our full-time team's hearts were offended because the question is, who decides who's the best? It's easy. Holy Spirit does. He decides who's the best. He takes the leaders of the church, the ones walking in front, out of the church to go on a mission trip, which the Holy Spirit organized for them, okay? Planned for, for them. So let me just say this. Oftentimes you'll hear the phrase, the Lord sent their best this is not a reflection of God's heart for favoritism. Okay, hear this. This is not a reflection of God's heart for favoritism. This is not what it is. But it is an indication that the Lord works differently than the mind of man. Because in the mind of man, the leaders can't go. Because the, if the leaders go, the church stands still. Mind of man. But in the heart and mind of Holy Spirit, he's like, listen, where they need to go, it's hard soil. We need anointed leaders. We need leaders that know and carry a revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't give me those in training. I want the best. Okay, go. Man would send those in training. <laughs> <laughs> but the Holy Spirit would not hesitate to send the top leaders of the church to go and to do His work. Okay, let me say this. Basic Christian maturity sounds like this. Basic Christian maturity. If you want to know if you're a mature believer, here's a reference for you. Basic Christian maturity sounds like this. I pray and I obey. Basic Christian maturity. Let me dissect this. It means that I have a heart for Jesus and I have a heart and a passion to spend time with Jesus. And as I spend time with Jesus, I hear that He speaks to my spirit and He speaks to my mind and He, and he shares things of His heart to me and the only way that I know how to respond to the things that he's asking me and sharing with me is to say, yes, Lord. It's the only response. And that is, a Christian, a Christian is marked with maturity the moment that you live that life. You pray and you obey. You're not only praying and giving your list and babbling the whole time and speaking the whole time. Listen, if you are doing all the talking in prayer, you're not praying.
If you are doing all the talking and praying, you're not praying. Jesus has a desire to talk to you. He has a desire to reveal things to you. He has a desire to open up his heart and speak to you about the things that you are speaking to him about. So listen. And so here's these leaders, they're praying, they're fasting, and they're not only ministering to the Lord, but they're actually open to receive from the Lord. And as they're receiving from the Lord, they hear the word of the Holy Spirit saying to them, separate to me your top leaders. Separate these guys so that I can use them for something else. And what does the Scripture say? The Scripture says, and they fasted, and they prayed, and they sent them out. Okay, so it's like a hamburger. You get a bun, and the bun is fasting and praying. And then you get the meat, and the meat is when the Holy Spirit speaks. And then you get the bun again. You fast and you pray when you hear a voice. So make sure that that was his voice. Okay? And that's exactly what, <laughs> what the church is doing here. Okay? Listen, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, verse 3, then having fasted and prayed. So they fasted beforehand, they prayed beforehand, they fasted afterhand, afterwards they prayed afterwards. Basic disciplines of Christian believers, fasting and praying. I'm so excited because of the fact that there's people in our church fasting that has never fasted in their lives. And they're actually fasting. They're actually trusting the Lord. And believe me, it's hard for them. I've talked to some of them and they say it sucks. And I just go, amen, it does suck. <laughs> because that's what you, you lay down things. It sucks. But the Lord honors it. Okay, and he moves. Spend time with the king of kings, listen to his heart, and obey whatever he asks. Banning Liebscher, the lead pastor of Jesus' culture, said the following. We were at a conference called Kingdom Culture Conference in um, Joburg in 2019. I think it was 2019. And as he was preaching, he said this, and it dropped in my spirit. I don't remember anything else that he said over that, that day. Nothing. But I remember this, because this is what the Holy Spirit awakened in my heart. He said, there's an anointing for the nations that is only found in your secret place. I'm going to say it again. It's in your notes. You'll receive it. But he said, there's an anointing for nations that is only found in a secret place. So the Holy Spirit was the one that commissioned them. The Holy Spirit was the one that sent them out. The Holy Spirit was the one that chose whom he was going to send out. And the beautiful thing of this is that the believers praying with them, they were praying with them. They were fasting with them. And in their hearts, they weren't jealous when they weren't sent. They weren't babbling and moaning and complaining because, Lord, we were also paying a price. We were also praying. We were also ministering to you. We were also fasting, and you only chose these two guys. What about us? No. They prayed, and they fasted again, and they laid hands on them, and they sent them out, knowing that this picture is bigger than us. Guys, this, this thing called missions, reaching the lost, going into the nations where no one wants to go to, this thing is bigger than us. It's bigger than Jan. It's bigger than Christ and Rossi. It's bigger than the full gospel church. It's bigger than South Africa or any missions movement. This thing is bigger than us. It's all part of the story of Jesus Christ. When you read your Bible... You see how the Lord dealt with people that He chose. That's the same God choosing you to do His work and His desires. And in heaven, there's actually a book written about you. 
It says in Psalm 139, there's a book written about you. And the moment that you are in the will of God, you are busy living out the chapter that God has risen, or written sorry, over your life. Okay, next, Acts 16, verse 6 to 9. Therefore, it's so important for us to be able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and not allow our, our fleshly and worldly mind thinking to get in the way of what the Lord wants to do. Easily we can be at a place where we are so entitled because of the fact that we, our hearts cling towards a person, for instance. Okay? Let, let me give you this example. I was the, the senior pastor of the church in Whitbank. Okay? Full gospel church in Whitbank, Christ in Rossi in Whitbank. I was the senior pastor there. And when we got there in the first month, the people came to us and said, we're not going anywhere. We have a 20-year plan for you. That's what the people told me and my wife, me and Mariska. Nine months after that, <laughs> the Lord sent us to Middleburg. And not one of them came with. <laughs> Even though they had a 20-year plan for us. Not one of them came with, okay? It's so important not to let our hearts be entangled to a person. The only, hearts, the only person that our hearts are clinging to is Jesus Christ. And if Jesus asks us to do something, it doesn't matter how sore or heart sore that is or how I, emotionally I feel about that. If the Lord asks Pastor Willem to go, it doesn't matter how much I love that guy, if, he's, if, he wants, if he needs to go, he needs to go because the Lord is sending him. And we need to submit under that because that is what the Holy Spirit wants. And in that, we need to know the voice of the Holy Spirit so that we will not be led by our, our emotions and not be led by our wants and our needs and our desires, but the desires of God. So in Acts 16... Verse 6 to 9, I've actually preached about this. Let me read it. It's actually the Macedonian call. <laughs> okay. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Guys, mature believers know when the Holy Spirit is speaking, even when it sounds contrary to the doctrine of the church. E even when it sounds contrary to what the rest of the body of believers believe and experience. Let me, let me say this. The church globally has something that we call the Great Commission. And this Great Commission wasn't initiated by any man. It was initiated by God. And He was the one that said, Go ye therefore and make disciples. Jesus said that. So this is the mandate of every single church because it is the mandate of every single believer. Not one believer is excluded from this. Everyone is called to make disciples. Everyone. Okay? So here's, a, here's the word. Here's the promise. Here's the commission. This is what Jesus is saying. And all of a sudden, Paul and those with him experience that the Holy Spirit is telling them not to go into Asia. 
Guys, let me tell you this, that most believers would have rebuked the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus told us to go. And Jesus told us to go into all nations. And now all of a sudden, Holy Spirit Kamastach is telling us not to go. Do you see how important it is for believers to know the voice of Holy Spirit? Because listen, this sounds contrary to the Word of God. Jesus told us to go. And he told us to go into all nations. Is Asia included in the commission? Yes. And all of a sudden, Holy Spirit says, don't go. What's happening, Lord? Jesus, you're saying go. Holy Spirit, you're saying don't go. And so many times in missions, the Holy Spirit will come and tell you something that is contrary to what the church believes. Contrary to what the popular opinion is. And you need to know the voice of the Holy Spirit so well that you do not rebuke the Spirit of God. Because let me tell you this, and not all preachers will say, will say this to you, but I will. You do not want to rebuke the Spirit of God. You will get rebuked. Hy gaat vir jou uitsorteer. Okay? It's like me asking Leyland to do something. If she says no, I'm like, I wasn't asking, little missus. I was telling you, jy gaan dit nou doen. Jy sal nou jou kos eet. Jy het die hele dag nog niks geëet nie. Jy sal nou eet. Nou, ja. <laughs> okay? Same thing. <laughs> uh, Yellow. 1 Thessalonians 2 <laughs> what now 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18 <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18 listen this is, this is the same guy that Acts 16 is talking about the guy that wanted to go into Asia and the Holy Spirit said no. And they didn't go into Asia. Same guy. He writes this. He says, Therefore, we wanted to come to you. Even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. These guys going out into the nations, going on mission trips, they knew when the devil was closing the door and when the Holy Spirit was closing the door. They knew the difference. They had discerning inside of their hearts. They were mature believers speaking to Jesus, spending time with Jesus. That's why we started at Acts 11. That's why we started at Acts 13 to show you that these people were people of prayer. People that went off to the heart of God. People that ministered to Him and loved Him. They had the discernment to know if it was the Holy Spirit that closed the door and if it was the devil that closed the door. And they also had the discernment to know how to react to the door that was closed. How do you react when the Holy Spirit closes, closes the door? How do you react when the devil closes the door? They knew how to operate in these things. So in contrast, we could see that Paul definitely carried the discernment to know when it was the Holy Spirit at work in his life or when it was the devil. Before you want to go into the nations, make sure that you can hear the voice of Holy Spirit. Your first assignment is not to get on a plane and walk into Algeria or Nicaragua or Turkey. It's not your first assignment. That's not the first thing. The first thing is knowing how to hear the voice of Holy Spirit. 
You need to be able to hear His voice. You need to be able to be led by Him. Acts 1 verse 8, you know this. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit anoints us with power. When you walk into the nations, you will need that power. You will need the anointing that the Holy Spirit brings. You will need the power that is miraculous, God, supernatural power that no man can fabricate. You need that power when you walk into a nation that has no tolerance and no knowledge for Jesus Christ and of Jesus Christ. You need His power. You need to be anointed by Him. Okay? The Holy Spirit anoints us with power. The word power there is dunamis. It comes from the word dunamai. Dunamai actually means God's ability. To be able to operate in the ability of God. To be able to do what God can do. That's what that means, that word means. The word dunamis is obviously the word miraculous power that can only be described as supernatural. It's something that no human person, no person can fabricate. Only when the Holy Spirit is upon you. And we will be His witnesses. We will be His witnesses. When I started tonight, I said that when you want to go into missions, you're going to have to pay a price. The word witness is the Greek word martus. It's where we get the word martyr from. The Holy Spirit anoints you to become a martyr for Jesus. A laid down lover of Jesus Christ. You can't even be that without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit for that. This is the true mark of a Holy Spirit over a believer. L let me just say this. The Pentecostal church... I'm opening up a can of worms. Well, okay, here we go. The Pentecostal church, which we're a part of. We are a Pentecostal church. The Pentecostal church believes that the first mark of the Holy Spirit over your life is that the fact that you speak in tongues. And let me tell you this. They miss the fact that we are called to be martyrs for Jesus. That you can speak in a tongue like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 and it can be like a clanging cymbal. It can mean nothing if you do not have love. And the Holy Spirit comes and He does such a deep work inside of us. He anoints us. He brings such a deep revelation of who Jesus is inside of us that we would gladly lay down our lives for Him every day. We will be martyrs for Jesus, laying down our reputations, laying down, down our dreams, laying down who we are, our ambitions, what do we want to see happen in five years or ten years? The world loves that question, don't they? Hey, where do you see yourself in five years? Oh, just get behind me, Satan. Seriously. I don't see myself in five years. I don't care. I don't care. Honestly, I don't care. As long as I am in the will of Jesus, doesn't matter where I am in five years. I don't care. Don't have this plan of being in Middleburg for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Sorry to disappoint you. I want to be in the perfect will of God. And wherever that is in five years, that's where I'll be. So do, my, do me a favor and go ask Jesus where I'll be in five years and come and tell me. <laughs> one, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 11, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You will need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You will need this endowment. You will need this empowerment of what the Holy Spirit comes and do over your life. And this is something that only the Holy Spirit can do. This is not something that you can fabricate. 
I say this so many times. I say this so many times to our team. I say, stop trying to make the river flow. Just jump in the river. Hou op om goed te probeer maak gebeur. Spring in die rivier. Holy Spirit gifts. The Holy Spirit wants every one of us to carry Him. And if we carry Him, every single one of these gifts are there freely. So, preachers and the Pentecostal movement has come and has, jeez, I don't even know what's the right word. Hulle het gekom in, in, uh, Wat noem het, as jy iets, as jy iets kreeuit en, en jy wil dit beskerm, so jy, jy, jy wil net die royalties het, dan, wat noem jy dit? Jy, ach, kom aan jylle, kom nou jylle, <laughs> kom nou jylle, help my nou uit man, copyright, ja, dit is, maar jy patent dit, ja, dankie, jy patent dit, <laughs> hou op, <laughs> Pentecostal believers and pastors have come and patented the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And let me let me just burst their bubble and your religious mind. That Jesus, the Holy Spirit, wants you to operate in all nine gifts. It's not only one. He's not calling you to one gift. Let's read, the, let's read the Bible. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Many gifts, one Spirit. Okay? There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. Go and read Ephesians 4, different ministries, one Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works on it all. Go and read Romans 12. Many gifts that God gave, one God. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Why does He give these gifts? Not to profit yourself, not to make a name for yourself, but to profit the one sitting next to you, or behind you, or in front of you. To profit the body. This is why you carry the gifts. <clears throat> For to one is given the word of wisdom. You see, this is where they get in. To one is given. Oh, jy is speciaal uitgekies. Net jy. Net jy in die hele kruisenrasie familie sal weis uitdra. Prijs die Heere. En dan kom in die kaart op sonde aan. En nou wat nou? Exactly. To another... The word of knowledge through the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healings by the same spirit. To another workings of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another different kinds of tongues. To another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. Kom ek geo net a a vertaling van wat die Grieks hier sê. Ons kom saam, we get together as a body, and inside of the body, there's a need. And the Holy Spirit comes over a person in the body to meet the need. So when we get together as a body, okay, and there's a need, but the fricky who got the need, or the gift for the need, stayed at home, what now? Want die fricky was ongehoorsom. And now it was, oh, we wanted to pray for healing, but we're so sorry. The guy that received the gift for healing, he's not here today. Sorry, guys. But don't worry, we'll, we'll phone him and ask him to come to church next Sunday. Please come back. Please come again. No, man. The Holy Spirit that works the gift inside of Fricky also works the gift inside of this Fricky. <laughs> and he can use this Fricky just as he uses the other Fricky. 
Want ons is allemaal frikkie sonder heilig gees in elk geval. We need, we need the Holy Spirit to do a deep work. Okay, so listen, now you're in the nations. And now you're, there's a need. Okay? Someone needs a prophetic word. And all of the sudden, the Holy Spirit drops a word inside of your heart for this person. You can't come and disqualify yourself and say, but Lord, you didn't give me this gift. Like, no, no, no. Same Spirit. The same Spirit. Because that Spirit is inside of me, that Spirit can manifest Himself just like He wants to manifest. And if He wants to manifest the gift of healing, then a gift of healing will be manifested. If He wants to manifest a gift of faith, then gift of faith would be, will be manifested. Whatever the Holy Spirit wants to, be happen, want to happen in that time, that is what's going to happen. And I know this is offending some of you. That's fine. You need to get over us. You need to read the Word of God, and you need to open up yourself to the possibility that God can use you in any area that He wants to give you and use you. God wants to use you in the nations. You can't come and disqualify yourself because you have a religious mindset, because there was a preacher that didn't understand this, and he taught you wrong, and now you're living with this wrong teaching, and now this teaching is offending you. Come on, guys. Allow Holy Spirit to burn away any fear of man that dwells in your heart and ask Him to teach you your identity so that there may be no disqualification. If I am a son of God, then God can come and use me exactly like He wants to use me. If the Holy Spirit only gives gifts to certain people, then why wasn't there nine Jesuses walking on this earth? But there was one Jesus and one Spirit over him, and he anointed him to do whatever the need was. Jesus is yielded to what the Father wanted. You can receive this or you can... Let it boggle your mind, and then the God's, God's not going to use you. That's okay. The problem with that is that you might get into a situation, hypothetically, you're in Turkey, and there's a need, and God wants to use you in that need. And now you have this wrongful religious mindset and lies because of previous people that have taught you things that are not true, and now you disqualify yourself because of that, and now that person misses out on the blessing of God. Stop disqualifying yourself. Listen to what the Word of God is saying. Listen to what Holy Spirit is saying. Be a child of God. Jesus operated in any gift because Holy Spirit came over him. Jesus is our model, not the preacher that taught you wrong. 2 Timothy 1 verse 6 to 7, Paul says to Timothy, I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Stir up that gift. If the gift is dormant, it's not the Holy Spirit's fault. It's your fault. Stir it up. Stir up the gift. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. We love that verse. And we quote that verse every time that we experience fear in our lives. But that verse is specifically aimed at people operating in the gifts of God. That God has not given you a spirit of fear so that you would live according to the fear of man. But that you would have boldness. Why? Because you received power when Holy Spirit came over you. Dunamis power. God's ability. God's ability. Holy Spirit does not want to be dormant in your life. I like what Bill Johnson says. He says, the Holy Spirit is in you as a river, not a lake. He is in you as a river, not as a dam. Okay? Bill Johnson also says this. He says, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and He wants out. He wants to flow through you. So the Holy Spirit would actually 
put you in the right room where he can use you, and it's up to you if you're going to be used or not. So he can put you on a plane, fly you all the way to Algeria, put you inside of a room where there's a need, and he can use you to fulfill that need. And if you don't have the faith or live with a crooked doctrine or are not based on your identity of who Jesus is calling you to be, that person is going to miss out on the blessing and you got on the plane for free. This is hard, big hard. I want you to realize the importance of this thing. Okay. <clears throat> it's so awesome. You know that there was seven feasts in the Old Testament, right? And you know that Jesus came and he fulfilled the feasts and that there are still feasts that need to be fulfilled and there are feasts that are fulfilled. There are feasts that are fulfilled and that are still going to be fulfilled. Okay? Like, for instance, um, the Feast of Trumpets. It, it is fulfilled, but it's still going to be fulfilled. The Feast of Tabernacles. It, it is fulfilled, but it's still going to be fulfilled. Okay? That's a sermon on, on another day. So during the Feast of Tabernacles, what happens was the priest would, during that feast, seven-day feast, every day, he would go with his golden pitcher, he would take water, and then he'll go to the temple where the altar is, and then he'll pour the water over the altar as the people that gathered there for the feast recites Isaiah 12, verse 3. Isaiah 12, verse 3 says, Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. That's what Isaiah 12, verse 3 says. On that day that I'm just describing, on the day that the priest is taking the water, he's taking it in this golden pitcher, he's taking it to the, to the altar, throwing it over, the people are reciting this. On that day, Jesus stands up and he says the following. John 7, verse 37 to 39. Jesus stood and he cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit is inside of you like a river, not like a dam. Okay, Out of him, his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But the moment that Jesus was glorified, we know what happened. We know what happened in Acts. We know what happened in the upper room. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, this is exactly the fulfillment of this. And Jesus stood there because out of his well, out of who he is, out of the well and the depth of who Jesus is, salvation comes. That's profound. Imagine that picture. Imagine how he offended the religious minds of, the, of that time. Oh, Jesus loved that. That's why I love it so much, because Jesus specialized in that. Jesus specialized in offending the religious mindsets. He specialized in it. Still, they did not receive him. Okay, guys, so the Holy Spirit is vital to missions. The voice of the Holy Spirit the leading of the Holy Spirit, the commissioning of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and our identity in the Holy Spirit. It's vitally important for us to know and understand so that we can be efficient when we walk into a country, 